quick words about, um, I'd also like to welcome those of you on the webcast who are watching now and in the future. Um, welcome to the Wilson Center. The center was founded by the Congress in 1968 as the official memorial to Woodrow Wilson. He was our only president with a PhD and he, having been president of Princeton, governor of New Jersey, felt that policymakers and academics didn't often speak to each other and so was founded the Wilson Center to encourage dialogue among <coughs> policymakers and academics and others. Um, we are part of the Smithsonian. We were founded as part of the Smithsonian Institution, um, we kind of arm's length. We are a public-private partnership with an annual appropriation from the Congress, and thank you, Congressman. Um, the center has about 22 programs, 20 fellows, about 30 scholars, and a staff of about 150. Um, we encourage dialogue, but we do not take policy positions. The Canada Institute itself was founded in 2000 to encourage dialogue on Canadian issues in Washington. Our mission is to increase awareness and knowledge about Canada and Canada-U.S. issues among U.S. policymakers and opinion leaders. Full stop, that's it. So it's a, that in itself is a tough order. We get generous support from the corporate sector and additional support from the governments of Canada and Quebec. We focus primarily on three topic areas, trade issues, border and border security, and energy and environment issues. We had a program similar to this last December on enhanced driver's licenses. I noticed some of the folks here were, were there, and I'm really glad to have you back. Today's program, Border Challenges and Regional Solutions, the 2010 Olympics and the Pacific Northwest Experience, is a partnership of several organizations, including the Pacific Northwest Economic Region and its CEO, Matt Morrison, who is here <coughs> around somewhere, the Border Policy Research Institute at Western Washington University and its executive director, Don Alper, over here. The Canadian American Business Council and its executive director, Scotty Greenwood. Um, and I'd also like to acknowledge the support of the Canadian Embassy and its various officers, among them Pasquale Salvaggio and Pam Lambeau. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the presence of several federal legislators here from Canada. Uh, from Canadian Senators, we have the Honorable Jerry Grafstein here, and the Honorable Janice Johnson over there, and we have several members of Parliament, including uh, Brad Trost, Gord Brown over there, Mark Holland back there, Guy André <coughs> over here, Brian Massey, and uh, Scott Bryson, who not here yet either. Is he here? Oh, there he is. Okay. Oh, I just arrived. You are. I brought him over with me. And we also have. <laughs> I won't. I so noted. Scotty. And uh, and a federal minister who will be introduced separately. I'll keep that as a, as a surprise, even though he's there. Some housekeeping. Your washrooms are out to the left. Please turn off your Blackberries as they interfere with the sound recording here, and this is being webcast, and we wouldn't want those who couldn't come to just hear electronic static. Um, today we have a very tight schedule. Panel chairs have been instructed to keep people on time. Please wait for a microphone when you speak as it is being recorded. Blackberries. And now we'd like to turn the microphone over to Karen Phillips. Karen chairs the Board of Directors for the Canadian American Business Council, one of our co-sponsors on this program. Karen is also Vice President for North American Affairs with CN. Karen. Thank you very much, David. It's a great pleasure to be here this morning. Uh, as David mentioned, my name is Karen Phillips. I have the honor of serving as the Chairperson of the Canadian American Business Council's uh, board of Directors, and I'm also Vice President for North American Government Affairs for CN for my day job. Uh, on behalf of my colleagues on the board of the CABC, we're thrilled and honored to be part of this event today. I would like to thank David Biet of the Woodrow Wilson Canada Institute, the Canadian Embassy, and Matt Morrison and your colleagues at PINWAR for all of your tremendous efforts in putting together today's program. It is a pleasure to partner with you today, and we look forward to having opportunities to do so again in the future. Let's move to the real reason that we're all here today. I think we can all agree that today's subject matter, border solutions, specifically how the regional cooperation that we currently see in the Pacific Northwest ahead of the 2010 Winter Olympics can serve as a model across North America. This topic and today's event could not be more timely, coming on the heels of the President's trip to Ottawa. 
Now that we have been reassured by both the President and the Prime Minister that they are dedicated to coordinating, the, coordinating their efforts on the challenges that we face, it's now up to us in the private sector to hold our leaders accountable and ensure that commerce between the U.S. and Canada receives nece the necessary attention and infrastructure funding. There is no doubt that the man I'm about to introduce will have a key role in ensuring that our border infrastructure receives proper attention. For we all know that improved efficiency of cross-border trade is the safest investment in both nations' economic recovery and future growth. On January 26, 2000, I'm sorry, January 6, 2009, Congressman Rick Larson was sworn in for his fifth term as a member of the House of Representatives. Congressman Larson represents the second congressional district of Washington State, which stretches from northern Snow Snohomish County to the Canadian border, encompassing all of Skagit, Island, San Juan, and Whatcom counties. Congressman Larson currently serves on the House Armed Services Committee, the House Transportation and Infrastructure Committee, and the House Budget Committee. He has been a leader in Congress on border issues and has been actively engaged in planning and preparation for the 2010 Olympics. Congressman Larson is well positioned, both geographically in terms of his district and by virtue of the House committees on, on which he serves, to address border issues. The Transportation and Infrastructure Committee, the TNI Committee, uh, as we knowingly refer to and lovingly refer to it here in Washington, is, for example, the House's largest committee in both terms of membership and jurisdiction, which includes highways, transit, aviation, rail, water, infrastructure, pipeline safety, the Coast Guard. Serving on this committee allows Congressman Larson to bring to the attention of Congress the Puget Sound area's unique transportation challenges. His committee service and TNI subcommittee assignments also cover the Coast Guard and all aspects of maritime transportation, including shipping and ports, as well as jurisdiction over highways and rail operations, which, of course, are of vital importance to cross-border commerce and trade. Commerce, Congressman Larson graduated from Pacific Lutheran University in Washington State and holds a master's degree in public affairs from the University of Minnesota. It's my privilege now to introduce Congressman Rick Larson. Thank you, Karen, uh, for the introduction, and I want to thank the um, uh, sponsors of today's program for inviting me to uh, to speak. Thank uh, the folks at the Pacific Northwest uh, Economic Region, or Penwer, and Matt Morrison, your folks, uh, great to work with. The Border Policy Research Institute at Western Washington University. Go Vikings, if there are any Vikings to go for. You guys going to fix that, Tom? Um, the uh, Canadian American Business Council and, of course, the Woodrow Wilson Center. Is, is Lee still in charge around here? That's great. Tell, tell Lee hello for me. Appreciate it. As the uh, U.S. and Canada prepare for the uh, 010 Olympics, uh, the, you know, the strength of our two countries' friendship uh, cannot be overstated. Our proximity, um, our shared values have forged a unique bond between the, the two countries, and, and history has certainly has borne that, self out, borne that out. Nearly $600 billion in goods were traded between our two countries last year. I think when I started in uh, 2000, we used to say nearly $403 billion in goods was traded each day. So that's uh, eight years or so, and it's increased up to 600, uh, and 600 billion. In Blaine, Washington alone, who knows where Blaine is? I love it. People know where Blaine is. So when I say from Blaine to Maine, uh, we understand what we... I know 70% of them voted for me. So that's <laughs> that's the most In Blaine alone, uh, customs brokers employ over 400 people directly, just in Blaine, Washington. That's the direct employment of the customs broker community in Blaine. So it's not a very big place, but clearly dependent uh, upon trade back and forth between the U.S. and Canada. And of course, across our countries, thousands of American and Canadians cross the common border each day for work uh, and for tourism. This friendship is felt every day, though, not only uh, on our common border with Canada, but around the world, where nearly 3,000 Canadians have served along the United States and other NATO allies in Afghanistan. The Obama administration has made it clear that our relationship with Canada is a top priority. Just last week, as was noted, President Obama chose Ottawa as the site of his first official foreign visit. I understand that uh, President Obama had a constructive conversation with Prime Minister Harper on trade, the need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, 
and the importance of cooperating on security measures along our common border, along with tasting some Obama tail, I guess. Is that right? So, well, they called it uh, a special recipe for the president. So, <laughs> In her first week on the job, Secretary of Homeland Security, Janet Napolitano, ordered a thorough review as well of our security on our common border. And I'm looking forward to her assessment, reviewing her assessment, and working with her to improve border security and border efficiency. And we've uh, forwarded a letter to Secretary Napolitano uh, with some thoughts that we believe uh, ought to be considered, and we can make that letter available to anybody. Uh, anybody who would like it, you can contact, um, contact my office and we can get that, a copy of that letter to you. In the coming year, an estimated 250,000 vis visitors from around the world will experience our common border firsthand as they head to British Columbia for the 2009 Police and Fire Games this summer and the 2010 Winter Olympics. Further, an estimated 3 billion more people around the world uh, are going to watch the Olympic Games on television. For many, it may be the first glimpse of the Pacific Northwest or the Canadian uh, Southwest. What do, you, what, do you, what do you guys call it? So the, not the Canadian Southwest. It sounds kind of crazy. Because <laughs> it's certainly not your Pacific Northwest, is it? The West, yeah, the Canadian, Canadian West. So how do we handle the influx of athletes, of tourists, dignitaries who reflect upon our re uh, who will reflect upon our region as well as uh, reflect upon our two countries as they visit? Well, first off, I want to talk about border security. In Washington State, we've been preparing for the um, OTAN Olympics and the, and the police and fire games since the IOC first um, announced that Vancouver would be hosting the hosting the games uh, in 2010. In 2004, the governor, uh, Governor Locke, formed the 2010 Olympics Task Force to help get the state ready for economic opportunities and the security challenges that we may face. This task force drew on the expertise of regional leaders in the fields of security, of transportation, of tourism, and of economic development to prepare the state for the Games. And right now, we're working to enhance regional security by building an emergency coordination center in Bellingham, Washington. When completed, this coordination center will help federal, state, and local law enforcement personnel work together to provide security for our region and respond to any potential threats that might come up during the game, uh, dur during the games. Senator Murray, Patty Murray, has helped secure $4 million to lease, build, and operate the operations center, as well as $500,000 to conduct training exercises for federal, state, and local law enforcement agencies. The Coordination Center will have room for at least 78 staff at any given time, as well as secure parking and a conference area for discussing uh, particularly sensitive information. Customs and Border Protection is working to get this up and running no later than June of this year. As work on the Coordination Center continues, the men and women who are going to staff it have already started working together and training. Federal, state, and local law enforcement officials are engaging in a series of tabletop exercises to prepare for potential security risks during the games, and the head of that from the, on the state's on the state end of things is General Tim Lohenberg, the Adjutant General of Washington State. The Coordination Center um, will be staffed by well-trained individuals who will help citizens on both sides of our border be safe. So the border itself, reducing wait times. I didn't bother to check this morning about wait times. Uh, well, of course, I've checked it this time. The wait times will probably be zero minutes uh, back home, but. Uh, we can always check online. I like to go online every once in a while um, and check to see what the wait times are at our border. But it is uh, actually difficult to predict exactly how much, Olympics, how much the Olympics will affect the cross-border traffic. I know one estimate from the Whatcom County Council of Government says that the worst, I'll call it the worst, the, the busiest uh, day during the Olympics would be no busier than the busiest weekend during the summer. But still, for February, that will be very, a very unusual, uh, a unusually busy day. Um, demand for tickets in Canada has been staggering as well, as I know the Canadians uh, are aware, with only about 3% of the Olympic tickets having been sold directly to Americans. Um, that's a, a good, in, good in one sense. Canadians are well uh, supporting the, the Olympics, um, uh, but it's bad because they'll all be rooting against us in the, uh, in the, in the old games. However, we know that many tourists, athletes, and other personnel will be transiting Washington State before, during, and after the games. So we have to have an adequate number of booths um, and, of course, Customs and Border Protection staff to process both normal traffic and um, as well as visitors to the region for the Olympics. As you might be aware, and I can't imagine you're not aware, uh, the General Services Administration, GSA, is currently constructing a new border facility at Peace Arch Crossing in Blaine, which will reduce congestion 
and help CBP administer one of the busiest ports of entry in the United States. Although this facility will not be fully completed by 2010, Interstate 5 will reopen for northbound traffic later this year, and the GSA has committed to providing temporary facilities so that we will have 10 booths up and running for the game. So although the facility itself may not be done, GSA is committed to uh, CBP as well as to the congressional delegation that they will have 10 booths ready to go for the games. CBP is also planning to open new booths in the emergency bypass lanes in Linden and Sumas by early July of this year. And additional lanes will help relieve congestion during both the Olympics and, of course, the 09 Police and Fire Games. Now, we're also aware that the Western Hemisphere Travel Initiative is going to impose new document requirements on U.S. and Canadian citizens crossing the border starting in June of this year. And uh, I think Governor Gregoire is speaking at noon today, if I'm not mistaken, so she may talk about the uh, EDL, uh, an update on the EDL program, Enhanced Driver's License Program. And if she isn't, I'll have my staff contact her staff to let her know she ought to do that, <laughs> since I have now probably put her on the spot for it. But Washington State has issued nearly 40,000 enhanced driver's licenses to date so far, making it easier for Washington State residents to cross the border quickly and efficiently. And, and, uh, and a, a hand to um, Pri uh, Premier Campbell as well for his efforts working with Governor Gregoire to make uh, the EDL program a reality. CBP says that 98% of travelers crossing um, already are complying with WITI uh, requirements, the Western Hemisphere Travel Initiative, but we need to make sure the other 2% and all those tourists who will be in our area for the Olympics but aren't familiar with the border crossing uh, or crossing the border know what documents they need. We have a little, uh, little uh, less than a year left to prepare for increase in traffic associated with the Olympics. So we need to stay focused on getting those resources and personnel uh, that we need to ensure that our common border with Canada is both secure and efficient. And finally, let me touch on the legacy of the Games. Uh, legacy is one of the themes of the 010 Olympics. And with all the work that remains to be done to prepare for the Games, it might be premature to start planning past the closing ceremonies. However, it's not, it's not too late to start thinking about that, in my view, about the legacy, what the legacy of the Games will mean for the Pacific Northwest. While well, U.S. and Canadian officials are cooperating, sharing information, and building trust on security matters in the run-up to the Games, and we should sustain that strong cooperation long after the Games end. We'll also have significant physical infrastructure in the Northwest Washington uh, after the Games conclude. We'll have temporary booths in Blaine, additional lanes open in Sumas and Linden, and an emergency coordination center in Whatcom County. And we should work together to make that, that which is temporary permanent as well as uh, making sure the needed infrastructure stays in our region. Millions of visitors and billions of TV viewers worldwide will get a glimpse of our region during the Olympics, and we need to prepare to capitalize on this publicity and grow our tourism economy over the long term as well. So those are th three elements um, of, uh, of legacy. Uh, finally, I'd, I just, uh, again, want to thank you for the opportunity to have a uh, – uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak and have a chance to, to be here today to – um, show support for the Woodrow Wilson Center, uh, for PINWAR, uh, Canadian American Business Council, but also, of course, for the Border Policy Research Institute at Western Washington University, who are doing, uh, I think, probably the for the first time over the last couple of years, for the first time, actually looking hard at, uh, at border issues between the U.S. and Canada and trying to help us as policymakers um, come up with some uh, innovative ideas to deal with our, our, ch our shared challenges. So with that, thank you, and I've got some time for questions. Thank you. You'll be moderating? Sure. Um, are there any questions? Scotty. Congressman, thank you so much for your yeah. uh, comments. One of the things Could you identify I, yourself, please? Scotty Greenwood with the Canadian American Business Council. Sorry. Um, we'll look at your letter to uh, Secretary Napolitano, and Great. glad you wrote it. One of the things I wanted to ask you is this. Um, with the very appropriate focus that Congress and the administration have on the economic stimulus and recovery. Uh, one of the positions that uh, our board of directors of the Canadian American Business Council has talked about um, is the idea that Homeland Security uh, is now an economic portfolio as much as it is a law enforcement portfolio because the way we manage the border between Canada, the United States, as you point out in your remarks, has a lot to do with the economies um, on both sides of the border. And I just wonder, in order for that to really soak in, you have to accept the premise that economic security uh, is as important as physical security. And I just wonder if you think 
um, it will be possible to engage Secretary Napolitano and the new gang that's running DHS in that kind of a dialogue, or if you think it's going to um, be sort of the old paradigm of, of just cops at the border. Thanks. Um, let me rephrase it say, is it probable that you'll be able to? Is it possible? Sure, it's possible. It's possible that it'll rain tomorrow. It's possible. I'm not gonna, I, it won't be a very helpful answer if I say yes, it's possible. Um, on the other hand, uh, I think it'll be more helpful if I say it's probable, and I think it is probable. Um, we do have a, a new secretary, a new opportunity. Uh, the, the challenge, I think, is that uh, Secretary Napolitano's experience is the southwest, or our southwest border. Um, although we do have security challenges at, the, at our, our border with Canada, they're, they're more related, in my view, uh, they're more related to um, uh, narcotic traf narcotics trafficking, which brings its own additional security element to it. And um, our, uh, our law enforcement and Canadian law enforcement on all levels has worked quite well together on some major interdiction. Uh, and we need to continue those efforts in a very in a, in a, in a very serious way and not undermine those at all. <coughs> but I also think uh, it's important for uh, it'd, be, it'd be important for Secretary Napolitano to get to the uh, get to the U.S. get up to the U.S. border with Canada to see um, see the backups in Detroit, uh, Detroit, Windsor, Buffalo, Niagara, and and, and Blaine as well uh, to get a better idea of the economic challenges that we face between the two countries and the need for border infrastructure that helps facilitate that trade. Uh, I, I think we have a, a better opportunity, well, and this is parochial, I understand, but I think we have a better opportunity um, at our border with Canada to show how to make um, economics and security work together, a better opportunity than we have um, at the U.S. border with Mexico. And uh, so hopefully we can uh, press secretary in that in that uh, in that direction. Can I just do a quick follow-up, David? Can I do a quick follow-up, Congressman? Appreciate your remarks. The thought um, that we have also is there are a number of things that DHS can do that don't cost additional money, but that make um, commerce legitimate commerce across the border more efficient and help the supply chain. So I guess. Um, what we would encourage you to think about um, with your colleagues in Congress are, is without spending any more money, are there ways to stimulate the economy? And we have lots of thoughts um, along those lines and would love to, you know, come in separately and talk to your staff if, if you'd be able if to. If you've got that. ways to stimulate the economy without spending any money, I'm all in. Okay. <laughs> you got it. Sure. I am Jill Hockman with the Federal Highway Administration. I'm right here. And House T and I is very important to us, <laughs> yeah, but right, um, yeah. I was going to follow up with your question or your position at working at USDOT, heading an office called Interstate and Border Planning. Yeah, we see oftentimes gaps that get created when physical infrastructure for security is changed, and then the transportation system has an impact. And so I would urge um, that when you're looking at Secretary Napoli. Tano's report on increasing efficiencies that you also consider the transportation impacts in that. Okay. Thanks. Since that's just a comment and a question, I'll, I'll, I'll take it under advisement and uh, got time, <laughs> time for another. Congressman, um, thank you very much for your comments. Uh, I've been to Blaine a couple times. Uh, just a little personal experience. I, I listen very carefully uh, to what I hear in Washington and what I hear in Ottawa about how the border is improving. And, and hold it, in, in Washington, D.C. In Washington, D.C. Okay. I'm sorry, okay. Congressman, Washington, D.C. Yeah. and Ottawa, Ontario. Yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> there's, there's not two Ottawas in Canada, so I got, I got Ottawa, that down. <laughs> Ottawa, Ontario, and Quebec. I have my colleague here from Quebec. And I decided, uh, and I visited every border point myself, because quite frankly, oh, yeah. because quite frankly, I looked at statistics about how the border was improving. I spoke not only to the agencies, but also to the executive, uh, I mean, not, not just to the cabinet uh, people, the equivalents, but also at the prime minister's office. Uh -huh. and heard it from the White House. And quite frankly, not one statistic I ever received was there anywhere close to being correct. Um, when I went to Blaine, uh, I, I remember that I was told that Nexus was really working and discovered that I could get through 
uh, the border qu more quickly if I didn't go to Nexus because the day, the two days that I were there, uh, the border wasn't manned properly. And when I talk to border guards in every border point, they all tell me on both sides of the border there's not adequate manning. So the cost and the uh, time to go through the border is increasing in terms of paperwork and all the rest of it. Yet at the point of sale, which is with the guards, they're less there today than they were two years ago in some instances. And by the way, the border guards in Canada feel, the Americans that are there for pre-clearance feel that they're overworked in terms of manning and all the rest of it. So there's a huge, there's a hardware issue, but there's also a software issue. And quite frankly, I, I don't see the software issue working. I think the border's worse uh, today than it was five years ago. A trade up until recently was going up, as you said. Uh, and the ability to get through Just a reminder, board. I said I had time for one more question. Anyway, comment. Yeah. Who are we to believe? <laughs> believe who you want. That's what I'd say. Believe who you want. I know the folks at, uh, on our side of the border who are um, uh, in those booths are doing a great job for us. Um, there's always room for improvement. We'll always keep working for more personnel. Uh, the nexus issues that uh, we've identified have less to do with uh, people in the booths and more with uh, the uh, renewal and appeals process for renewals. We're trying to improve upon that. Um, but uh, I, I tell you what, I, there's a guy, unfortunately he died uh, this last year, Andy Anderson, who worked for uh, me for a while, worked for uh, my Democratic predecessor for a while, Al Swift. And um, he, uh, he was a, one of the godfathers of uh, the Can Pass program, which eventually evolved into uh, the Nexus program. And he said, you know, you, he said, Rick, one thing you need to learn is that you'll never solve the problems at the border. You will only be able to manage them. And, um, and, and every, every year there's another set of management issues. And, uh, but I will say this, personnel has always been one of those things that we've always have, you know, consistently worked on, uh, worked on year to year. So I'm not saying that there, are, there aren't, aren't enough folks there. I never would, would say that. But I will uh, stand behind all the folks who are there currently doing a great job for us on our side of the border. Um, and trying, we're trying to be responsive to them as, as much as we can as well. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, everybody. Have a good day. Good morning. I'm uh, Senator Lisa McGuire from Alaska and the incoming president of Penwer. Uh, most of you in the room know what uh, Penwer is, but it's the Pacific Northwest Economic Region. It's a public-private uh, nonprofit um, that uh, is a collection of government officials and private sector leaders, um, premiers and governors that come together to solve all of our regional problems. And uh, this last year in Vancouver, um, July 20th through the 24th, Penware member jurisdictions and representatives, along with many of the groups who have representatives here today, assembled uh, together and created a, um, a Border Solutions Coordination Council. Um, it came directly out of a vision for the border and the prosperity that we hope to continue to enjoy in our region. And that Coordination Council has been um, hard at work um, out in the field uh, uh, meeting with stakeholders and looking at the problems and um, as part of the roadmap we came here today um, and are gathered to make recommendations for future border policy um, to outline a proposed regional solution to the the new um, administration and um, as the congressman said before it couldn't be more timely in light of Thursday's um, bilateral uh, summit and so our goal today we hope um, on behalf of Penwer to welcome you to thank you for all of the um, partnership that you have had with our organization uh, through the years and um, and to remind you that we are, are here in partnership with you to help develop recommendations um, to the new administration to that end, it's my honor to introduce someone who's been hard at work on this issue um, and hard at work with Penwer for many years. We consider him a valuable uh, member of, um, of our organization. 
Um, he is uh, the Honorable Gary Lunn, and he was first elected to the House of Commons back in 1997. He was re-elected in um, 2000, 2004, 2006, and 2008. He went on to serve as Minister of Natural Resources from February of 2006 until October of 2008. And it was in that capacity that I first got to know him. Um, certainly Alaska um, uh, is one of those unique uh, parts of the United States that has tremendous natural resources and your country in Canada does as well so he's been an invaluable resource that way. Um, on that point Matt always wants me to remind people that we're the only uh, state in the United States that can uh, can only be reached by going through the country of Canada and so um, it's invaluable for us in Alaska as well to have friends uh, like we do in Gary Lunn. He's been a strong advocate for amateur sport in Canada for many years, and so he was a natural um, selection uh, for the Minister of State Sport. And he received that title on October 30th of 2008 and has been hard at work ever since that um, point in time, helping to promote the upcoming 2010 uh, Games in Vancouver. He practiced law in Victoria before entering um, federal politics, and interestingly enough, uh, He's a certified uh, carpenter. He was on the uh, Canadian Ski Patrol, and uh, he taught first aid uh, for the St. John's Ambulance. I think it's always interesting to point out people's passions and backgrounds. So please help me welcome the Honorable Gary Lenn. Good morning, everyone, and thank you very much, Lisa. It's always back, great to be back uh, with my friends here at Penwar. Uh, I remember last time I was speaking, uh, Matt, to this group, it was in Edmonton, I believe, uh, with my good friend, Ambassador uh, Wilkins, and it was, I was talking to you about Canada emerging as energy superpower. Now, uh, since that time, I've had the, uh, the great honor and responsibility of being the minister responsible for the 2010 Olympics, and uh, as I tell everybody, I think I've got the best job in Ottawa. I've got all the happy news these days. You know, as we're just a little less than a year away from welcoming the world to Vancouver. And it's a pretty exciting time. We're going to, uh, over half the world will be tuning in, uh, billions of people. And uh, obviously, uh, we want to leave a very positive image. Um, and that only can be done if security is strong enough, not only to deter, uh, but also ensure that we can prevent any problems. But at the same time, when you want to make sure we have that security just right, um, it also is important that you strike the right balance so it's not overwhelming. Um, we not only want to showcase the competitions, which we're quite excited about, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that, uh, but it's also important that we showcase our culture and obviously uh, our magnificent country. And we've been investing a lot, as you know, all levels of government, preparing for 2010 um, in our infrastructure, in our transportation system, and we've in the, the process of building a brand new highway up to uh, Whistler, which was badly needed, um, and uh, obviously rapid transit, the new sky trains, the Canada Line from the airport, um, that's all going to be very important as well. Uh, the venues, uh, the sporting venues right now as we speak, every single sporting venue is complete, it's operational, they're hosting international competitions, all the test events, um, they're absolutely breathtaking, they're, and they're, uh, they're uh, quite exciting to see. Now, as it's already been uh, talked about, uh, of course, we're, this is quite an important meeting uh, uh, following on the heels of Prime Minister uh, Harper and President Obama's uh, great uh, start last week in their, uh, to renew their historic friendship. And these friendships don't just happen by accident. Uh, these relationships um, right now are starting in the offices, as I say, right at the top between the President and the Prime Minister. And there's an enormous commitment on both sides, um, areas that we can help on our energy security, tackling climate change. The two uh, leaders have committed to work cooperatively to find a North America solution, and we believe that's obviously very, very important. I can tell you that this joint approach um, will be stronger. It'll be a more effective way to deal with our shared problems. Um, I actually prefer to uh, refer to them as opportunities on energy security and border control and climate change. And I know there's a, the focus here is on border control, and I want to challenge us here in this room how we can move that forward. Our long-term friendship and partnership in free trade has grown both our economies, it's improved our communities, and some even might say that it's pioneered the global 
uh, value chain. Today, it's clear that Canada has played a valuable role in addressing many of the domestic challenges facing here in the United States. The United States and Canada have one of the strongest trading relationships in the world. As um, most people in this room know, Canada is the number one supplier of crude oil, <coughs> gas, uranium, electricity to the United States. The results are important economic benefits based on a mutual willingness to let the markets work between themselves and a mutual understanding of the need to ensure our shared physical security. We need to harness the opportunities inherent in international trade and investment, not only to ride through the storm, but it's really important that we say to ourselves, where do we want to be when we come out of this storm? We want to be stronger. We want to be more competitive and more cooperative than ever before. With such close economic ties and such a deeply integrated industrial base, it's clear that our economies will either succeed or fail together during this challenging time. From our history and our trading relationship, it's clear that Canada must be part of the American efforts to get overcome these challenges and help both of our economies move through the crisis together. So our policy has begun as we work towards 2010 Winter Games, and we have to think in the long term, not just about today's games, not just about what's going to happen in 2010, but build on beyond and our lasting legacy long after the games are done. Now, there's going to be, you know, the obvious legacies out of the games. There's going to be um, amazing sporting complexes. Uh, I have to share with you, I've been up to, as they say, in the last month and a half to most of the test events. I saw the sliding center, um, the bobsled, the skeleton they actually tried to get me in one of those bobsleds. It was declared the fastest track in the world. These guys were coming down at over 150 kilometers an hour. Um, I watched the ski jumping. These guys were absolutely nuts to see what they go off the end. Um, and, and, you know, these are it's important legacies, um, the public uh, legacies, the transportation, the infrastructure, um, increased border to capacity, uh, you know, those, those are really important legacies. The other one that we also see is very important, and something as a lesson we learned following the 88 games is that we didn't capitalize on the opportunity after the games. There was all this build up, and then it sort of went off the edge of the cliff. So we recognize we really want to build, and we're, we're putting a lot of uh, uh, more resources into things like tourism beyond the game, so we continue to build on those legacies. Coming back to our border, um, and people talk about, you know, the and I remember the numbers too. I remember when I was first elected uh, almost 12 years ago, we used to talk about a billion dollars a day in two-way trade between our two countries. It's now 1.9 billion, 400,000 people every day. $1.4 million of trade between our two countries every minute. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, th these are important numbers. Again, we keep pu putting them out there, but it is truly a remarkable trading relationship. The other one I always think of is we have a billion dollars, a billion dollars that flows between our two countries every day um, through either a, a pipeline or a transmission line. Just uh, you think about that. So as we increase the security and prayer to host the thousands of people that are going to cross the border and be part of the games, it's essential that we have to avoid the thickening of the border. In these global and certain economic times, the worst thing that we can do is where there's legitimate businesses that are struggling is facing added delays, bureaucracy, and regulations um, at the border. Um, we have been working together to improve things, to promote prosperity rather than inhibit it, um, you know, the question came up, and I think it was from you, Scotty, you know, can, is it possible that we can engage? Is it possible we can move it forward? A and the answer came back, well, it's <coughs> probable. Um, I'll push the envelope even further. I think it's essential. It's absolutely essential. You just think about what both of our respective governments are in the process of doing right now. We are investing billions and billions and billions of dollars if not trillions down here. I think I, I know the numbers that we're investing in economic stimulus is, we need a glass of water? I think we've got an extra one up here, don't we? Here's one. 787 million. 
Yeah, so it's almost a trillion. I just know the numbers are so big, they've got a whole lot of zeros behind them. <laughs> but as we're making these type of investments, the worst thing we can do is allow, you know, I talk about it in Canada, even on our regulatory systems, where we frustrate people to no end, things that we can fix if we've got the determination and the political drive to do it. Same thing at the border. We have to stop. We have to make it, uh, we have to push the envelope further. We have to, you know, things like pre-clearance, which has been pushed before, but we need to push it even harder now. There's never been a more important time to seize, as in right now, this opportunity. And I, I strongly believe that. I mean, some of the things that we've done in Canada, and this may sound shocking, but we're actually uh, now in the process of arming our border guards. Um, this is not done before. <laughs> You can laugh, it's true, and, uh, but our border guards weren't armed in the past, so this is something that we're doing. Um, how important is that? I can tell you there's examples, and I know it at Blaine, a very busy border crossing, where they were tipped off, the Canadian government, that there was some, um, let's just say, bad people coming at the border. And what did our border guards do? And, and, and rightfully so, rightfully so. I'm not diminishing. They closed the border. They left. They're not armed. Hey, these are some bad, bad people coming. Um, they called the police, but they shut the border till this issue was resolved. <laughs> Just imagine shutting down a border like that for half an hour, an hour, and then the mess it leaves behind for the rest of the day and all the people trying to carry out legitimate trade and move people across the border. Um, so, so we have to do a better job. And we're also working with organizations like PENWAR to encourage and promote international trade between our countries, ensure travel between our countries is, is safer, that it's hassle-free. Um, and we've introduced several uh, collaborative efforts between trade and security. You know, the, uh, a good example in my home province in British Columbia uh, is the enhanced driver's license. You know, um, Scott was, we were talking about that yesterday, but this is something that, you know, both governments are sitting down, Washington State, and saying, Listen, how do we make it easier? How do we, we want to move people simpler. So this is a, something a small but an important step. The Nexus card that's been developed, obviously that's very important as well. And, uh, you know, I actually think it's working. I don't have a Nexus card, but I tell you, when I go across the border and I'm sitting in the lineup and I'm watching, um, I've, I've got the opposite story of the congressman, that I'm in the lineup without the Nexus card and I'm watching that Nexus lane empty and everybody's just flying by. I keep saying, I've got to do that one of these days. So, but at the same time, it gives my wife less shopping time, so it's probably better for my own economic stimulus not to get down there too soon. But, you know, we're, uh, and we're introducing uh, lanes of the border that are going to be identified, you know, uh, to help 2010, to move people quicker, dedicated lanes. Um, but as I say, we should never sit back and just become complacent. We need to push the envelope, I believe, much, much further. Um, the other area that's going to be very important just is another border that's going to be critically important um, during the games is obviously the Vancouver Net International Airport. That's going to be the first impression left by travelers. And our approach to making uh, these successful and secure games will leave a lasting positive image to the international community will be important when they come through uh, YVR. Uh, Canada is known as a global as a good global citizen, a valuable trading partner, and a safe country, we have to take pride in these images of our country and work hard to ensure that they remain. Um, we're also taking a page from our friends who hosted the Olympics in Australia to capitalize on the opportunity of the worldwide audience with half the world's population, as I said, turning to the opening ceremonies. Building up to the Games, we're using opportunities at trade conferences, international events and meetings, drawing in tourists from around the world to get people thinking about and visiting Canada. During the games, I know the venues and scenery, as I've said, will paint a picture um, of absolutely its natural beauty, but also it's going to be important as we showcase our larger cities. We're taking steps to capitalize on this opportunity uh, and build on this, uh, this image. Um, we have uh, Diana Blonzi, our minister responsible for tourism. She's developing a very extensive plan, uh, I call it Beyond 2010, to how we seize those opportunities. Um, but I also want to emphasize the true image of Canada comes across directly and unrefutably when people do enter our borders, and I can't stress that enough. The smooth border screening process is the very first impression when people enter your country. 
And uh, I've heard that so many times from people. If they have a bad experience, whether they're coming through an airport, whether they're coming across the border, um, you know, it leaves a lasting impression. Safe Games is one of the highlights. Uh, Canada's a peaceful and secure nation, and that's going to be obviously very important. Um, as I'm certain by now, some of you read about the security costs um, for our games in 2010. I think that number is now out there as uh, $900 million. Um, but the, the cost of the security will be what it will be. We will have secure games. That's very important. Um, you know, and it's... Uh, you know, this, I don't know if how many of you have followed this. The original number uh, was 175 million put back in the bid in 2003, long before we were in office. But even in fairness to the government of the day, then, um, you know, and and, and we're you get some you get criticized the media. You know, how could it go from 175 to 900 million? It was a requirement of the IOC. You actually have to have a number in the bid, but nobody even knows where the venues are, where they will be. There's absolutely, you know, no idea on how that will happen. And so eight years later, you have to come up with your security. But it will be an integrated uh, presence by the RCMP, by the military, by local police uh, to ensure uh, that, that we are secure uh, and obviously uh, to make sure that our trade and investment areas um, obviously are not jeopardized as well. Um, in the last few years, we've added a significant more police, uh, both at the municipal, provincial, and federal level. Uh, we've also added 1,600, 1600 municipal police officers, and we've added an additional 400 border guards uh, since we've took office uh, just over three years ago. Uh, the key personnel are working on border security, but it's also um, Another area that's very important that we work on um, is on the international investigations, things like human trafficking, trafficking down pedophiles, and the anti-smuggling. Uh, in addition, additional personnel uh, and infrastructure um, to increase um, our technology as well. Uh, you know, the technology is going to be critical um, just to ensure that we are successful. Uh, as I've said earlier, we've invested billions in our highways. Uh, We've invested, uh, we're building a, a brand new um, at Peace Arch um, and new facilities for our border uh, agency there as well. Uh, the two main crossings uh, at the Douglas Blaine and Huntington and Sumas have received federal funds to reduce the bottlenecks uh, for people coming up from Washington State uh, to ensure. And, and that, as we improve those um, border crossings, the infrastructure is going right up into Vancouver and all the way up into Whistler to ensure we have the dedicated lanes. Uh, let me talk a little bit about the... Um, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about the sporting side of it. This is the fun stuff that I get to do. As I say, we've... Uh, as I say, the the border is going to be very important, and I and I I'll, I'll come back to my conclusion on the border. But just on the on the sporting side, on the athlete side, um, we're quite excited as we host the games. And one of the more more important things when you're hosting a games is for the host country to be successful. I remember speaking with the IOC, and they they really impressed upon us how important that is. And we came up with a program called Own the Podium. In fact, it was started by the previous government. And it, it's so successful. We've now made the funding for that permanent. But it's we had, didn't really support our elite athletes, and we're really starting to see positive results right now. Uh, in the last two weeks, um, our winter athletes at international competitions um, have won an unprecedented 41 medals, 14 of them gold. And I got to go watch a lot of these. A lot of them were Olympic test events to test the venues, the, all the facilities, our screening systems. And the, uh, I have to sh share with you some of the stories. The, the ski cross, I don't know if many of you have seen this sport, uh, but these guys are absolutely crazy. It's, for, it's like roller derby on skis. Uh, but in that event, uh, we won five of the six medals um, in the figure skating. Uh, Patrick Chan, Joni Rochette are winning the gold and the silver. Uh, and the list goes on and on. So we're quite excited about our athletes and how well they're doing. As uh, Again, we get ready to welcome the world in just a little less than one year from now. Um, and we have every intention of winning the most medals. So 
for our American friends in the room, um, we're leaving room for you to be second place, but uh, Good luck with that, Minister. we're working on that one, Scotty. And we're gonna have to be, I'm going to have to get you a Canadian scarf so you can be there cheering on the right team. But uh, in any event, let me just uh, get to my conclusion here. Um, we're really excited. We're less than one year away um, about welcoming the world as we host them for 2010. Um, Canadians are feeling really good. This is a very positive experience. And, you know, there's some pretty challenging times on both sides of the borders. And, you know, there's no magic silver bullets as we try to come out of this. Um, although we're all committed to doing everything we can to um, ensuring that uh, we're making the investments needed to keep people, to keep their jobs as we move forward. And I'll stress, as I said earlier, I think this is essential that we push the envelope on both sides of the border at every level of government, at every level of elected office, that we challenge um, our agencies, that we challenge officials in our departments, that they have to be more successful in making a more seamless uh, movement of both goods and people across our borders. That does not mean that we have to compromise our security in any ways. In fact, I believe we can strengthen it. and. Uh, I think the opportunity is ripe, as I say, things like pre-clearance, looking at every kind of opportunity, thinking outside the box on how do we move this. And, and the 2010 Games can be a great, perfect example um, when we do that to continue that legacy on. As I say, it's very important that we don't just look at this immediate crisis. We don't look in the short term in the next six months, the next 12 months, because I don't believe anybody knows exactly for sure when we're going to come out of this economic downturn. Nobody knows. But what's really important is that when we do come out of it, that we're in a position of strength, that we're more competitive, that we're stronger um, than ever before on both sides of the border. So um, with that, I want to thank you for inviting me back to Penn where I'm at. It's always great to be back uh, with my friends here. And um, I'm happy to take any questions. Is that the plan? Am I supposed to take questions? Probably time for one. Time for one, okay. Yes, Minister uh, Jim Matkin from uh, Vancouver. Uh, Co-chair of the uh, Canada-U.S. Uh, Relations Committee. Your uh, former colleague, uh, David Emerson, yes. last week uh, advocated in terms of the long term, and I applaud your focus on that, uh, that it's time for us to consider a customs union between Canada and the United States. That the way to, to uh, stop the thickening of the border in the long term is to really uh, encircle uh, the two countries. That's pushing the envelope. What's your view? You know, there's. I, I read. I read David's article, and I've got a lot of. David's a very good friend of mine, and uh, he's a very smart guy. You know, let me just say, if, I, I want to get away from the name, whether it's a custom union. Um, you know, obviously we have two sovereign, very different countries, but we also have uh, very close shared values, very close shared principles in, in many, many ways. So whether you, in fact, form a customs union or not, and I'm not advocating that at all, I do think, though, what we need to do is say, what is our desired goal? What is our desired objective? And I believe that is to ensure that we can move people and goods more freely across the border um, and without compromising our security on either side of the border. And, and I think we can do that, um, you know. If you tried to advocate we wanted to create a formal customs union, um, sometimes, you know, something is that formal, um, at least watching on my side of the border how slow things can take sometimes, may never happen. So I, I think what you should try to do is look at how do we achieve similar results um, so we have a much freer, um, open uh, border uh, that we can move people 
across that we can move goods across. And again, the, the obvious one for me is things like pre-clearance. You know, when you look at uh, the amount that moves across our border, and you know, sometimes trucks are six, seven hours sitting in lineups over the summer at some of our crossings. That's just not okay. You know, they can't make money that way. You know, we can't have things taking that long. You know, the auto sector. You know, you look how they're struggling, and you look how many parts go back and forth across the border before they actually make a final, before they end up with an end product. Um, they, they have to move much quicker. So I'm not sure I would advocate a customs union, but um, I think what his stated objectives, I think we could, you know, there's a lot more we can do to achieve that. That's it. Thank you very much. We're now going to reset the table. There's a couple chairs for those of you who are standing to fill in. And, um, We'll be going in about two minutes. Nice to see you. No, I'm going to leave because I've got a flight. We have our next panel up, for, up forward, Sukumar. And Thanks. Um, yeah, I do. I mean, it's I love doing that, but it, this is good. I mean, it's uh, it's not as challenging policy. But, but this is all the let's say the happy news. So he he wanted somebody from BC. Yeah. How are you doing? On our side. Do well. Yeah. We'll have to plan a visit. Yeah. That would be great. Absolutely. Um, thank you very much. Well, you Should you give me one second? I can blow that up for you. Stay on schedule today. Um, we're going to try to finish this panel up at about 20 to 25 after so that you have a few minutes for a break. And um, with that, we will get underway. First, let me introduce myself. My name is Cindy Gillespie. I was the head of government affairs for the Atlanta Olympic Committee and then for the Salt Lake Olympic Committee. So I spent about 13 years of my life doing Olympic Games. I therefore have great admiration and a um, little bit of bittersweet longing for anybody that's engaged in the effort right now. It is something you will never forget in your life. I want to set the stage a little bit for our panelists and for what we're going to be discussing today by, um, if you don't mind, just looking looking sort of historically at what the Olympic Games are about, and it's from this const construct. When a nation agrees to host the Olympic Games, one of the core elements that you agree to is that you are going to provide to the world for a period of time basically what is a piece of neutral to neutral, uh, to neutral <laughs> um, soil. You are going to provide a place where the world can gather. And you're going to let your normal boundaries and restrictions down so that everyone can come and be there in peace. It is a wonderful concept. It is what actually does occur when you hold an Olympic Games. It is, uh, for those of you who have never been, it is phenomenal. There is a unique element that happens when the world comes together and they are all there as one. At the same time, what it means as a challenge to the host country is enormous. You have to put in place special entry provisions. You have to put in place special customs provisions. You have to essentially put in place for the Olympics a separate way of doing business to ensure that the world can come. Um, it's very obvious when you step back from it. No nation that is hosting the game should be able to decide which athletes come from another nation. You know, they should be able to send their very best. 
On the other hand, you want to make sure that everyone is safe. So it's the com competition of these two challenges that forges a very unique set of procedures around an Olympic Games and forges a very unique dialogue. From that comes always, one of the things about Olympic Games is it always fosters new, new uh, methods of cooperation. It always forces you, as several of you have said today, to think outside the box, to find new ways of doing things. And what always ends up resulting is a legacy not just of infrastructure and not just of economic advantage, but an incredible legacy of new models of behavior, new models of cooperation. And for the host city, I think the unsaid legacy that is always there that is so powerful is once you have pulled off what is the equivalent many times of 10 to 15 Super Bowls a day for 17 days and you have faced challenges that you never thought you could do as an individual and it only comes about because at the end of the day every individual involved somehow reaches inside themselves and does more than they thought they could do, you end up with a city that goes, we can do anything. And that creates the biggest legacy. An Olympic city forevermore feels like they can do absolutely anything and they always take off. So today, you're looking at one of the bigger challenges. And this one is compounded more than usual because you've got two nations and you've got entry issues where people are arriving in one and moving to the other and they're moving cross-border. An incredible challenge one we haven't done before in this continent. And I'm going to be very interested in hearing what our panelists have to say about it, and I am just delighted it's not mine to try to work through. So with that, let me introduce our two panelists. First is Sukumar Parawal. He's the Executive Director, Strategic Policy and Planning in the Intergovernment Relations Secretariat, which is part of the office of the Premier of British Columbia. Uh, Sukumar has worked in intergovernmental relations for the past 10 years, most recently as Director of International Relations. His responsibilities include helping to set British Columbia's intergovernmental and international priorities and leading a culture of innovation in the Secretariat. Parawal also works with the ministers on building strong relationships with neighboring states through regional cross-border organization, and he leads an inter-ministry working group on border issues. During 2006 to 2007, Parawal was the Fulbright Visiting Chair in Canada-U.S. Relations at the University of Washington in Seattle. His academic background includes a Ph.D. and an M.A. degree in International Relations from the University of Oxford. His postdoctoral work has focused on nationalism, conflict resolution, and cross-border cooperation. Hugh Conroy is the project manager at the Whatcom, is it pronounced Whatcom? Whatcom. Okay, Whatcom Council of Governments in Bellingham, Washington. For the past eight years, his work has centered on the Whatcom Council of Governments lead agency role with the International Mobility and Trade Corridor Project, IMTC, for those of you who are familiar with this, which is a binational cross-border transportation planning coalition. He was involved in ongoing regional coordination and project delivery, delivery through the IMTC project, and he has covered a variety of U.S.-Canada cross-border trade and travel issues. Public and private entities working through the IMTC continue to identify priorities for the regional border gateway, plan improvements, a simple project funding partnerships, and cooperatively oversee implementation on several initiatives. Con uh, he received his undergraduate degree from the University of California at Berkeley and his master's degree in public policy and management from Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh. So with that, what I'm going to do is give each of our speakers about eight minutes. They've told me to be a very tough taskmaster. And that way we'll have time for a, a dialogue with them, which I have, think a lot of you would enjoy from what I've seen this morning. So we're going to start with you, Sukumar. Thank you very much, Cindy. Um, well, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm representing two BC ministers who unfortunately weren't able to be here. Um, my minister, um, Joan McIntyre, who uh, is the Minister of State for Intergovernmental Relations, and John Van Dongen, who's the Minister of Public Safety and Solicitor General, and who is also Penwur's president this year. Both ministers sent their regrets um, and uh, are looking forward to the results from this conference. Um, it's a... Um, it's a treat to be here for me because um, I get to tell tales out of school. Um, and the five um, slides that I'll show you are basically photographs. And with your permission, I'm just going to tell a few stories associated with those slides. 
Um, the three points I would like to make today for you um, echo in many ways the points that Minister um, Lunn and Congressman Larson were making. Um, I guess the three stories or lessons that I would want you to take away from um, the description I'm going to give you of the executive level cooperation between British Columbia and Washington State are, first of all, relationships matter. The continuity of relationships creates trust, which, results, which leads to results. The second um, point that I would want to make for you is that it's really important to focus on citizens and their needs. It's the solutions that we generate when we think backwards from what it is that's going to work for people, for the people who are actually going to be crossing the border. It's the customer, citizen-oriented solutions that actually res um, bring about the kind of legitimacy of solutions that we as governments or as policymakers are able to put forward. And that's been a central focus of the BC Washington um, cooperative process in the last few years. And the third point I'd want to make is, again, a point that Minister Lan made very articulately, which is um, the 2010 games are a legacy. 2010, as, as you said, Cindy, you know, it's a mammoth enterprise in, in and of itself. However, the main point of 2010 is that, firstly, it can result in a quantum leap for the entire region in terms of attracting tourists, students, immigrants, um, increased trade and investment. And secondly, that it gives us an opportunity, a very specific um, deadline for getting things right at the border. So those are the points I'd want to make for you. Um, I'm going to show you a few, few slides that illustrate that. Um, the first slide is a photograph taken about 10 days ago. It's the Countdown to 2010 event. That was when we got it. This is one year away. You see up there Premier Campbell, John Furlong, who's um, got the unenviable and enviable position of being um, responsible for the success of the 2010 Games. Um, you have an Olympian, and you have um, th that basic sense of, okay, this is a tangible event. This is going to happen. Are we going to make it succeed? Absolutely. So how do we do that? Um, well, one of the key things in that has been actually establishing a really regular process of interaction with our closest neighbors, the state of Washington. Since 2006, the BC and Washington cabinets um, have met annually. That's three years in a row now. I've been lucky enough to be one of the people who you know, does the backroom work for that event. And it has been absolutely um, a tremendous learning opportunity just in terms of seeing how easy it is to actually align the priorities of two governments um, from two different countries who happen to have a shared purpose and whose leaders set the tone. I really take very seriously the idea that these events are not just symbolic get-togethers. They result in a specific alignment of values and priorities that percolate through bureaucracies and which help um, people like me working in ministries or in line departments, actually set our goals and come together to achieve specific objectives. So the fact of an event like this actually creates that kind of shared purpose and sets the tone and gives direction for people to be able to work together towards this common goal. And that illustrates the point I was trying to make around 2010 being one of those um, catalytic moments where two governments, two jurisdictions see a shared opportunity and are able to say, okay, let's work, to work together to make this happen. I'll give you another example of that. Um, out there in, um, in the foyer, you'll find, if you haven't picked it up already, a copy of a letter that Premier Campbell sent to Governor Gregoire again last month, I believe, um, offering that Washington State and British Columbia can together have part of the torch relay that will be running through um, the entire country, th through Canada. Um, that's the Olympic torch. Again, I can't think of too many Olympics where that has happened, where a jurisdiction offers its neighbor the opportunity to actually participate in the excitement and community building aspect of an event like that. There's been a very strong focus on 2010 and the border, as I mentioned, in terms of the getting together of these leaders and their you know, cabinet colleagues. Um, there have been 17 MOUs that have been signed, a lot, of whom, a lot of which have focused on border issues, on transportation, on the pragmatics of getting emergency um, cooperation efforts together. 
And one of the culminations of those was a joint border action plan, which is extremely symmetrical with and um, supports the work that Penwar has done, for instance, in terms of the border charter that it's put forward. Um, the goal, again, has been finding specific smart solutions. The enhanced driver's license, which I'll come to in a moment, is one of those solutions. The goal has been consistently to respect the good work that our federal agencies are doing and to say there are ways in which, at our level, states and provinces can contribute to that effort to build security in North America and facilitate trade and travel for legitimate purposes. Um, examples of that include strengthening um, the security and um, integrity of foundational documents. We trust our f passports. Do we have good reason to always? Well, passports and the integrity of passports relies on documents like birth certificates. In British Columbia, we have strengthened in the integrity of our birth certificates. We have made them a better, stronger document. Similarly, the work that we have done on driver's licenses and on enhanced driver's licenses is an effort to build security in an area which falls within our jurisdiction. So on enhanced driver's licenses, again, I want to thank our federal agencies in both, in both countries for the support that they've given for British Columbia and Washington State in making this solution a reality. It hasn't always been easy, and yet it has been a milestone achievement in many ways. It's been an achievement where, again, all governments have looked at the needs of citizens in terms of having an easy document, something that you can carry in your wallet and forget about it, until you have the dis you've made the decision to cross the border and you, know, you don't have to be fretting about whether you've taken your passport out of your um, bank um, deposit box or whatever. You have your enhanced driver's license in your pocket. It makes the process of crossing the border something which you can take again for granted. And that is the critical thing in terms of ensuring that the two economies are not delinked. So again, in that picture you'll see Premier Campbell, Minister Van Dongen, who spearheaded that effort from um, the government of British Columbia, and Federal Minister at that time um, of, Homeland Secu of Public Safety, um, Stockwell Day. Um, one of the pivotal moments in the whole process of getting this together, getting the signature achievement of the enhanced driver's license together, was uh, an, an event that Penwer, much to its credit, sponsored, where um, then Homeland Security Secretary Chertoff and Minister Day met, and met with regional stakeholders, a, an event chaired by Minister Van Dongen, and that was the moment when permission essentially was given for the enhanced driver's license to move forward, something which we then moved on at the executive level. And this is the last point I would really want to make. Again, a point that Premier Campbell makes routinely, which is that regional cooperation, because of its focus on local solutions, solutions that have um, been fed by and which reflect the desires and needs of citizens and border communities, that that kind of local cooperation can be a pilot, a test bed, and can potentially be extended out for larger solutions, whether it's across the length of the Canada-US border or across North America. There are ways in which we can really build on the trust relationships that have been established in our part of the world, the Pacific Northwest, which by the way, in Canada as well, we refer to as the Pacific Northwest, not as our Southwest. <laughs> um, we share that sense of being part of the Pacific Northwest region of North America, and that's the essential trust relationship that we have. That trust relationship has created results. It creates that sense of being able to believe in the integrity of each other's processes and in the capacity of our border businesses and our border guards to be able to talk frankly in ways that actually lead to real results. That can then be applied further. So that's the real um, value, in a sense, of the kind of executive level cooperation that has been taking place and which I believe will continue to take place. Thank you. Thank you. Thank um, you. I wanted to start off with a quick story. Uh, I was at, um, I came in a couple days early to town and had a couple days to, to be a tourist and found myself over at the um, National Museum for the American Indian and on, went to the fourth floor, which I guess is where they suggest you start your visit and came across this statue uh, depicting uh, then General George Washington and a couple of prominent figures from the Oneida Nation. 
And uh, so I read the plaque on the wall and, and went through what the various elements of the statue referred to, but there was no mention of the uh, rock wedged between a couple of branches hanging above George Washington's head. So I asked the cultural interpreter there uh, what that was about, and she said, well, that's a real common way that the Native people would mark a boundary or a border to take something like a stone and put it out of its natural context um, in a tree like that. And uh, so I just thought that was too funny. Here I am just an hour into touring around D.C. and I'm already at, already at a regional border uh, meeting. Um, here they were actually celebrating or, or uh, noting the um, formation of a government-to-government -government agreement. Uh, and presumably this is in upstate New York somewhere, probably not too far from Lake Placid, so they actually had a Winter Olympics in their future as well. Um, a little different uh, cross-border working group than I work with, the International Mobility and Trade Corridor Project, uh, again, is a regional binational planning coalition. Uh, it's not a formal institution. It's uh, really a voluntary forum uh, made up of uh, area representatives of uh, federal, state, provincial transportation inspection uh, agencies as well as private sector uh, representatives. Um, it's focused on a very specific geography. That's the slide up on the screen right now. Um, you've heard these places mentioned before this morning. Uh, the four ports of entry that we call the Cascade Gateway are uh, Peace Arch, um, serving the connection there at I-5 BC Highway 99, Pacific Highway, uh, just a mile to the east, 10 miles east again, Linden Aldergrove, and Sumas Huntington uh, on the far right, far east. Um, that again is just about 20 miles uh, span, so a pretty tight uh, focus. Um, so the point of these opening remarks so far really is that the function, the composition, the scale of IMTC uh, is fairly distinct, and uh, those things together have served very well um, project-level international uh, collaboration. Um, I won't go into a whole lot of detail today, but I do have a handout that I left by the door, uh, one of a few that I brought with me. Um, in here are uh, details on some of the projects, uh, but also uh, a more detailed list of the member agencies and entities that participate in IMTC, um, folks like uh, uh, Border Policy Research Institute at Western and, and Penn were uh, a couple of our collaborators as well. Um, numerous objectives of IMTC were identified at the outset. Uh, I won't go into those either. They're also in the handout, but I will touch on them in terms of three uh, broad categories. Uh, the first uh, one was the improvement of planning and data collection. Uh, good information has really been at the core of a lot of the binational projects that we together have promoted. And uh, all the better if the agencies using that data and information can be involved in the early stages of collecting that data, uh, analyzing it, and compiling it. Um, so my office, the Watkin Council of Governments, has been uh, very involved in managing some of those data collection projects as well as becoming uh, a compiler and data clearinghouse for our uh, regional IMTC partners. Um, to that end, I'll just point out this, the next handout that I brought with me today, which is an updated uh, sheet of some of the higher level trade and travel data uh, that we collect for our partners as well as a one-page briefing on the IMTC project as well. Um, the second area of projects that we're involved in is promotion of infrastructure improvements. That's a pretty straightforward uh, objective, but it's worth pointing out that a lot of these uh, projects have been binationally funded, occurring right at the border, serving both countries uh, roughly an equal share. Uh, and they also incorporate a lot of intelligent transportation systems uh, investments, which are definitely key to the way we are uh, together operating our border crossings uh, these days. Uh, the last area, uh, broad category of objectives, is operations policy and staffing. Uh, under that header, I would n note things like uh, the marketing uh, uh, initiatives for Nexus and FAST programs, which I'm sure you've all heard about, um, institutional issues related to deploying technology solutions at the border. Uh, Technology, although complicated, is often not the hardest thing to crack. It's, it's working through institutions uh, on either side of the border or across border. And it is under that header that we also added an objective related to the upcoming Olympics. Uh, in 2003, right after the Games uh, Award was announced to Vancouver Whistler, uh, the IMTC uh, participants really did want to make sure we were tracking what the implication might be for the Cascade Gateway border crossings. And so to that end, uh, we adopted a, 
objective of working to ensure predictable and efficient uh, travel to and from the Olympics as best as we could. But um, as has been pointed out by several speakers already, uh, the Olympics is by definition an international event. And so the, uh, the excitement and the anticipation associated with the Games really has just jumped right over the border and uh, spread at least through Washington State and into the uh, Pacific Northwest, which I'm glad to hear is a, a name we can use without causing a diplomatic stir. I always wondered that. Um, so, so in that lead up, um, the border though has become a focal point um, and a lot of agencies and organizations in the Pacific Northwest have developed what you might call uh, checklists of things that really need to get done before the games commence. IMTC's focus in this regard uh, has primarily been um, trying to pull together information, again data, to help us uh, predict as accurately and confidently as we can what the actual travel demand might be at the border so that our partner agencies and uh, ministries of transportation, et cetera, can make sure that we're uh, planning for probably a conservatively high estimate, but nonetheless we want to make sure that the border is not a problem. Um, to that end, we've had the opportunity to work, uh, meet with uh, representatives of, at the Salt Lake City, um, sorry, Utah Department of Transportation, uh, folks who worked on their Olympics, uh, have made some good connections with the transportation departments and the Vancouver Organizing Committee, and have also worked with uh, BC Ministry of Transportation and Washington State DOT to make sure we're promoting the importance of traveler information uh, to make sure that any increase in travel demand is spread as efficiently as possible amongst those four crossings that you see. People coming from the area aren't going to know that they have these options unless we reach out to them. Um, one of the things I was asked to touch on on the agenda is just the overall implications for or improvements being done on the I-5 corridor. Uh, the next slide just sort of gives you a slice of the geography that we're probably referring to here. Um, on the bottom of the screen is Eugene, Oregon. That's pretty small, actually. Uh, Eugene, Oregon, and on the top, uh, Vancouver, uh, right in there, and Whistler just up here. Uh, the Cascade Gateway, which was the earlier slide, is in that purple ellipse there. Um, to cover off, uh, because I don't have that much time, the improvements that have gone on on that corridor, I, the third handout I brought with me is a a briefing from the Washington State Department of Transportation. Um, they have identified and accelerated the completion of uh, multiple projects along the I-5 corridor and other state routes uh, accessing the border, um, advancing both the funding and scheduling of previously planned projects to make sure they were not going to be under construction uh, during the game. So those have been completed. Uh, they've also enhanced their maintenance plans regarding snow plowing and all sorts of things that could be a potential uh, strain on traffic, uh, made additional investments in information technology and uh, rail improvements as well. Um, other improvements that I wanted to mention coming from other agencies are the uh, new border station, uh, Canadian Border Services Agency station at the Douglas Peace Arts facility. Uh, not only a beautiful structure but an important increase in capacity. And uh, BC memoranda that Sukmar mentioned, the security uh, task force that Rick Larson mentioned, and a 2007 BC uh, um, Burlington Northern Santa Fe rail agreement completed in 2007 with a subsequent improvement as well. Um, I should point out that this uh, Washington State DOT uh, flyer um, jumped the gun a little bit and lists that second Amtrak train service as having begun. Um, that is still hung up on an issue of how the additional inspections of inbound passengers will be handled in Vancouver. Um, I think Penworth's involved in working on that issue as well, and so we're very hopeful for a, a near-term uh, solution to that. Um, a few projects that I'll point out that are uh, in the handout, uh, an infrastructure project of Nexus and Fast Lanes, an operational project of the um, Advanced Traveler Systems, a memorandum of agreement signed between many of the border operations agencies on incident response uh, being more of a policy project. Uh, these projects and many others like them, I think, leave the Cascade Gateway very much uh, in a good position to really go unnoticed during the Olympic Games. I think that's our goal. We don't want the border to be the story. We want the Games to be the story, um, which I think is a shared objective from a lot of people working on this. Um, so a couple of things uh, in conclusion are really just reiteration. Uh, regional binational coordination I think is a very core element uh, to our national interests in strong cross-border connections. That's been a, I think a harder sell over time outside of border communities to really appreciate that. 
uh, but the Olympics um, and the excitement around that has definitely sort of grown the geography of concern and appreciation for the border. So uh, I think when we're talking about legacy, which has been brought up a few times, uh, I would hope, uh, and I think a lot of our partner agencies would hope, that this kind of increased attention will be one of those legacies. So we'll wrap it up there. Thank you. Thank you, Hugh. Appreciate it very much. All right. Um, I think we're going to open for questions now and spend about, oops, got the watch off, spend about 20 minutes um, having a dialogue here with our panelists. Who would like to start? Yes, sir. If you could identify yourself as you start, please. Yes. It's coming. I'm sorry. Senator Grastin, I'm chairman of the uh, Canada U.S. Interparliamentary um, a group that's been here in Washington talking to governors and Penoir, and then we're going up to the Hill tomorrow. A uh, question I have for you is uh, uh, rapid transit, urban transit. We heard at the governor's meetings yesterday the importance of moving from the old technology to the new technology, which is rapid transit. And the question I, I, I noticed that you sort of raised the issue and there were some obstacles. What are the obstacles to uh, uh, getting faster trains uh, inter and uh, intra and interurban along this corridor? Um, well, I'll try to stand in for our regional rail experts as much as I can. But um, the obstacle I spoke of in terms of the clearance at Vancouver is uh, simply one of, of cost recovery for inbound inspections of passengers by uh, Canada Border Services Agency. Um, with regard to the bigger issue of developing a better high-speed rail corridor, um, at least between, say, Eugene, Oregon and, and Vancouver, uh, that stretch of rail is primarily single track. Um, it, it has had a lot of uh, capacity constraints along it, mudslide problems. Um, so the improvements that were made in Lower Mainland BC went a long way to enhancing that. Uh, and it's a shared passenger rail track and a Burlington Northern commercial uh, rail corridor um, heavily traveled by not only BN trains but probably more traveled by Canadian National. Uh, so there's just uh, sort of a, a functional um, demand issue there as well. Um, I invite anyone in the room with more knowledge of those things to enhance that answer. But thanks. I, I would just say that, you know, the states of Washington and Oregon have spent $300 million on this train, and we finally got the second train, which makes the whole thing work after 18 years, and we're simply waiting for a $500,000 a year CBSA approval so they can handle the inbound passengers in Vancouver. That's the holdup. We're ready to have a great train service. It's the highest occupancy in the whole Amtrak system. It's a, a Talgo train that's capable of going 180 miles an hour. We're working to get that over time. But it's a great investment. It's a public investment. But we're waiting on the Government of Canada to, to get a waiver, especially for the Olympics, and get that second train rolling. Could you tell us what CBSA stands for? Canadian Border Services Agency. Thank you. And, um, anybody that can help us with this one, it'll be a great. We appreciate the commercial. There are a lot of conservatives and liberals here. We'll take this matter up when we go back to Ottawa. Thank you. Next question. All right. Then I'm going to ask one before the next person does. Um, Sukumar, you mentioned several times the trust relationship and how that was the key to what had enabled you to accomplish what you have in the last several years. If you look across the rest of the borders, what would you say would be the, you know, what would you say would be the first thing you would tell other regions that they need to do in order to begin to establish that trust relationship? With, since they don't have an Olympic Games, forcing them to the table to reach resolution before 2010. Tough question. Um, I think uh, my perspective would probably be establish things like IMTC and Penwar. Um, those are critical in terms of getting that basic coalition of relationships together. IMTC has been doing, and it's not a paid advertisement here, but IMTC has been doing absolutely stellar work in terms of bringing people together um, monthly, um, annually, t 
you know, people who have a strong um, working interest in the, the files of cross-border transportation, um, in, in terms of border stuff, in terms of having a need to move people back and forth, ministries of transportation, departments of transportation, regional governments, et cetera. Um, at, at the working level, having those relationships is critical, clearly, um, because that does percolate up as well as the other way around as well, which is to have um, a premier and a governor or you know, perhaps more. But I think bilaterals work well in, in terms of being able to have um, the ability to set the tone. I, I, I thought, for instance, the, um, what I've read so far from the president prime minister meeting last week um, was actually pretty good in terms of substantive outcomes, in terms of um, not necessarily making lofty commitments, but making um, specific directions that can then be acted on. I think from my perspective, having worked on the um, what we then called the high-level dialogue between BC and Washington, which then became the joint cabinet meetings, the critical thing was really to have that basic um, shared commitment by the premier and the governor to finding specific solutions for a shared issue. So. Thank you. Let's see. This gentleman here, and then we'll go to you, and then we'll go to you. All right? That way you can pass the microphone back one by one. So we're going to this gentleman right up here first. Uh, thanks very much. Ted Alden from the Council on Foreign Relations. I, I had a question for Mr. Parawal. It's, it's the same on the issue of trust. I saw a story in the Canadian press last week about data under the Enhanced Driver's License program that had been shared on a pilot basis with Washington State that was then pulled back to Canada on privacy grounds. I'm just wondering, what are the data sharing arrangements? Are they acceptable to both sides at the moment? Maybe you could just talk about some of the issues there, because obviously there are real privacy concerns with uh, some of these enhanced documents. Thanks. Um, again, I mean, I'm not uh, a privacy expert, and I ha I'm not directly responsible for the implementation in day-to-day -day terms for EDL, so I don't want to get the details wrong. Um, I think the way in which we managed to um, ensure a timely approval for the enhanced driver's license, on the Canadian side anyway, was to break it up into two parts. One was in terms of a phase one, which was a very limited number of um, enhanced driver's licenses to be put out essentially as a pilot. Um, and the, with the proviso that there would be a phase two, which was to roll out sometime this year, which would be for all Canadians living in British Columbia. Um, some of the issues, as you say, have been privacy related, um, which is around the sharing of um, personal information that Canadians have. You know, do you want to pass that? Do you have the legal capacity to pass that on to American border officials prior to someone actually crossing the border? Um, the EDL has always been um, a voluntary program. So essentially, what people are doing is um, being told and ha having to explicitly sign consent forms saying that they understand that the information that um, will be collected from them um, is exactly that information which they would submit in any case if they were crossing the border. So all they're doing is um, giving that same information in advance and then um, you know, not having to provide it at the moment when they would be um, you know, clear it at the border. Um, in terms of the specific uh, information that's on the card, it, there's none of that. The, the card itself is only holds, I believe, a certain randomly generated 96-digit um, or something identifier number, which is a pointer to a database, if I'm, if I'm getting the technical details of that correct. Um, that, again, the RFID chip is potentially protected by a little sleeve and so on. Um, the pilot project, because of the lack of, um, and this is where I may be stepping into technicalities that are beyond my comprehension, but as far as I understand it, um, in the pilot phase, the idea was to have the information about people be um, manually provided because there wasn't the capacity for um, real-time electronic verification of that information between the CBSA databases and the CBP databases. So the idea was in the pilot phase to give that information um, 
on essentially, um, I, I guess, so a, a sort of a, a sharing off of a hard drive, essentially. And now that we're entering into phase two, which would be a much larger scope enterprise, the idea is that that data goes back to CBSA's database rather than being in CBP. So again, the idea is to comply with Canadian privacy regulations. Sorry, that may be too technical an answer. Scott Bryson, I'm a Canadian member of parliament from Nova Scotia. Um, I was speaking with uh, Governor Gregoire over the weekend, and she is so enthusiastic over the Enhanced Driver's License uh, program. And it strikes me that faced with um, a short-term challenge in terms of the Olympics and the need to ensure seamless movement of people across the border, that Washington State and British Columbia really demonstrated great leadership in terms of a very practical approach to an immediate issue. But to what extent has it created a model uh, that can be duplicated? Uh, across uh, Canada and the United States between provincial and state level governments. There's a lot more of our citizens with driver's licenses than passports and it's such a practical approach to uh, uh, the, uh, you know, a challenge that we both face regardless of where we live in either country. The seamless movement of people between the borders is, is really important. Um, so does it create a model that there can be leadership through the Council of Federations, for instance, on the Canadian side or the National Governors Association on the U.S. side, um, where we duplicate it and what obstacles would we have to uh, that successful rolling out of the model across Canada and the United States between state and, and uh, provincial governments? Washington State has been absolutely a pioneer in the U.S. in terms of sharing um, their business plan and the way in which they've rolled out EDLs with other states. Um, they have had um, seminars in Washington, D.C., co-sponsored sometimes by Penwer, um, where they have, in fact, shared their information. Their director of licensing, Liz Luce, has been, I think, really very successful at outreach with her counterparts across U.S. states. Um, in Canada, again, British Columbia, as the pioneer for it, we have been working with our um, Canadian Border Services Agency colleagues to, again, make the information out there for our provincial and territorial counterparts to take up. And we've been strongly encouraging, um, uh, I guess, other provinces and territories to also consider the value f for their citizens of being able to issue enhanced driver's licenses. Um, the business model is, I think, uh, now set. It is now possible for other jurisdictions to take it up and to roll it out. Ontario has certainly um, been very um, engaged with British Columbia in terms of having a partnership approach to rolling out enhanced driver's licenses in their jurisdiction. Um, Quebec, I believe, is also very interested. Um, Manitoba is also engaged. Other jurisdictions have held ba back partly because of um, their uh, cost concerns, partly due to issues like privacy. Um, and on the U.S. side, there has been interest expressed as well by various states, including, um, I believe, Vermont, New York, New York and Michigan. Um, I think it's, it's one of those things where, you know, the original impetus for this was clearly um, a, a way in which the enhanced driver's license represented a solution for various demands that were being posed on states. Um, and provinces, things like the WHTI legislation as well as in the U.S. the Real ID um, legislation. Um, the enhanced driver's license represented a way out of that, a way that actually um, was a real solution as opposed to a mandated solution. And I think that you know, the, the future of the enhanced driver's license program, in, in my personal opinion, um, depends on the extent to which it can be made a cost-effective and comprehensive solution. So, for instance, enhanced driver's licenses that are valid for air travel within North America would make it, I think, a much more attractive option. I, I personally don't quite see the rationale for not having it be extended out there, and the um, air industry experts that I've spoken to also believe that it could very easily be made conformable with the various IAT regulations, et cetera, on that. So, again, making the enhanced driver's license something that is convenient, cost-effective, and um, valuable for all kinds of purposes across the board on a voluntary basis seems to me the way to, the way to go. Thank you. Let's see if you could hand it to Ms. Jana. Thank uh, David you. Davidson from the Border Policy Research Institute. 
So in each instance, I heard you mention the extent to which relationships grow uh, between the premier and the governor, for instance, or at the IMTC forum between individuals and a level of trust is built. I guess the question is, what happens when the individuals change? Um, if Governor Gregoire had lost the election last fall and a new governor was in place, what would that possibly mean for this B.C. Washington train that has been going for a few years now. And likewise at IMTC, are there key people that when there's turnover of a new port director, that kind of thing, does it, does it set back the forum? Are there new obstacles to have to overcome? Um, that, that's a great question and definitely uh, that's part of the sort of care and feeding that these cross-border forums uh, depend on. Uh, and we've been careful to anticipate these things. So, as, And we've had a couple of notable turnovers, uh, a change in personnel at the port directorship at Canada Border Services Agency and a recent retirement, one of our commercial chiefs at CBP. But in both instances, uh, I think we were able to anticipate those and start working with their uh, either assistants or predecessors or you know, people coming in after them. Um, and have been very lucky in the level of engagement um, that all incoming uh, folks have had. So um, it's, a, it's a key element when you're working at that level, uh, and we hope to uh, avoid uh, any misses on that score in the future. But um, it has boiled down. It, it also illustrates the importance of the relationships and of the trust that you know we are potentially vulnerable to something as simple as a turnover like that. Um, so we pay attention. I think um, people like Hugh and Matt are indispensable figures in this. Um, the reason I say that is because they anchor um, organizations that are non-governmental or cross-governmental. Um, what they essentially do is they make it possible for a dense web of relationships to coalesce around their organizations. That gives a, a basic relationship the durability and coherence that it needs, I think, for action at higher levels. You, it's, in a sense, it creates that safety net. Um, it creates a trampoline, if you will. And um, you know, I, I think that uh, the relationships between premiers and governors are indispensable, and at the same time, they are um, replicable. So I think when you have that strong, durable safety net, it is possible to actually not have to worry all the time about reinventing that high-level engagement. We have time for one more question. This gentleman right over here. Uh, could you wait till he brings you the microphone? Sorry, it's a little hard to hear. Guy-André from uh, Quebec. A member of Parliament, uh, I didn't hear you talk about the causes around that driver's license, and I was wondering if uh, uh, once this driver's license is going to be done and is going to be used to uh, travel uh, um, uh, borders, uh, do you think that there, there could be arrangements with other countries uh, in the future that this driver's license could could be used to travel uh, elsewhere uh, around the world and replace the passport. I, I don't think that the driver's, enhanced driver's license is a substitute for the passport. I think the passport as an internationally recognized travel document has a very valuable purpose and I think it's really incumbent on federal governments to keep strengthening the value of the, the security of the passport. Um, and to um, create global standards for an, an increasingly secure travel document that's recognizable um, and con commensurable across, gov across jurisdictions um, on a global scale. I think you know, the dri enhanced driver's license was never meant to be a substitute for the passport. Really what it is is a, um, a convenient alternative that's accessible for people who are making these short commutes or who travel on a regular basis and so on. Um, and so I, I think you know the the premise is is really that the two documents aren't mutually substitutable except within North American contexts. All right. Let, okay, we'll do one more. Uh, this is actually a continuation. Um, I'm Eleanor Fox from the U.S. State Department. Hold on. Can I? 
Um, and, and just to point out that at least for the U.S. issued EDLs, I'm not quite sure what the situation in Canada is, they are in fact usable not only between the U.S. and Canada, but also between the U.S. and Mexico and also within the Caribbean. So it's not just a one country solution. Um, there is no intent to go beyond that because there are a number of very complicated issues of IATA standards, cost recovery, and so forth. But it is not solely for the U.S.-Canada border. Um, and can I just can I just say that also for all of those who are not in EDL states and are U.S. citizens, there is also the passport card, very inexpensive for anyone who already has a passport. Actually, fairly inexpensive even for anyone who does. Um, which is, again, another good alternative for anyone who is a regular border crosses, but, pro crosser but does not want to get the Nexus card. Great. Can you hand that to him? And we'll actually be very quick, please. I need to make a technical correction to that. I'm also from the State Department. Uh, <laughs> actually, these cards are good for re-entering the United States from those countries, from, from, from other places, right? They're really, in, in terms of Canada, Canada has no documentary requirements for U.S., so it's not particularly, it's not an entry document for Canada in any technical sense of the term. Under WITI, these cards allow you to be documented for purposes of re-entering the United States. Right? A passport is a different sort of document, which by international agreement allows you to enter foreign countries based on common practice. And we do have a passport card, which we've issued about 850,000 of at the moment. So there are very, very large numbers of these in circulation compared to the numbers of EDLs in circulation, for example. And in terms of overall solutions, there are about 90 million passports in circulation. There are less from all states participating, 100,000 EDLs in circulation at the moment. So there are multiple solutions here. They have different purposes, right? And they need to more or less uh, be thought about in terms of what they were intended for. The card solution was meant to be a way to facilitate uh, travel at the border right, uh, for people who needed a convenient wallet-sized thing that they could carry. And there are multiple solutions for that, too, the EDLs and the passport card. So, uh, but I did want to clarify, since the person brought out you know, the distinction between passports, there's a major distinction between these documents and what they accomplish, both practically and legally, and what a passport does. Great. Thank you very much. All right. Um, in closing, I, since Minister Lund gave a uh, warm shout out for the Canadian Olympic team, I do want to point out that I've noticed that the U.S. Olympic Committee's representative in Washington, D.C., Karen Irish, is in the back of the room. And um, in closing, just say that I know we're all looking forward to next year, a little less than a year from now, where we're going to be able to go back and forth across the border very easily so that we can all cheer for both teams. And we're looking forward to, the, to Canada and the U.S. bringing home a lot of gold in 2010. Thank you very much.